So hello everyone, I'm Léa Taradieu, I'm a research fellow in, at uh, INRAE, which is the National Institute for Agriculture and Environment. And I work in, um, in a lab uh, which is called TETIS, which is a lab uh, working mostly on remote sensing. And I'm also associated to CIRED, um, a, a, a lab working on environmental economists. So I am an environmental economist and I'm going to present uh, today a project which is called uh, Mapping Ecosystem Services to Assess and Design Urban Planning Policies, an illustration from Ile-de-France. Um, I go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so... Um, to begin, some context elements. Um, from uh, the project I chose to present to you today, uh, the background of the project is that biodiversity uh, conservation and uh, associated well being are not sufficiently uh, considered in urban planning. Um, <clears throat> yet, uh, at the same time, uh, there is a growing uh, uh, demand for urban nature which is observed, as well as a global appeal for the nature-based solutions development, uh, reflecting the urgency to address increasing urban risks like uh, flooding, heat waves, and so on. Um, for example, you see this uh, survey in which I uh, was uh, asked, uh, how would you define the city of the future? And 53% of the, of the respondents answered a city where nature plays a central role. So uh, in this context, the, fresh, the French National um, Ecosystem Assessment, which is called EFES, uh, Evaluation Française des Écosystèmes et des Services Écosystémiques uh, in French, asked us to help urban practitioners to better consider these issues in day-to-day -day decision making in urban planning. And to do so, uh, we construct um, this project uh, to build operational planning tools for ecological diagnostics, integrating functionalities of nature and contribution to people. This is how uh, the project was born. So uh, the IDFES team was uh, not only uh, from economists, but also uh, from many disciplines. And so uh, the project was interdisciplinary, including economics, hydro hydrology, climate science, ecology, and spatial planning. We propose in this project to analyze the territory through the lens of society and nature interactions. And one way to describe these interactions was through ecosystem services, which I uh, will tell you more in the, in the next slides. Uh, it is one way to, to, to approach this interaction because, between nature and society, and it is the way we chose. We also chose um, multi-criteria analysis, renouncing to um, many problems like aggregation, comparison, and substitution between ecosystem services. We also assumed that uh, the quality of supply and demand metrics um, um, was dependent on the participation of uh, diversity of actors to be as close as possible to the decision-making context. And our aim was to provide spatial information and GIS-based uh, tools, uh, geographical information systems. So here you have uh, the link to, to the project, which has uh, everything, publication, methods, and everything. A brief digression now, because I told you, um, I, I told you that uh, we relied on ecosystem services. And just to be sure, I wanted to, to describe uh, this concept um, more deeply to be sure that you understand uh, the, the rest of the presentation. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, so ecosystem services uh, lie at the interface between uh, two spheres, between the ecological uh, sphere and uh, the social sphere. So it's the interaction be between uh, nature and society. We have ecosystems that have uh, that have the capacity to produce flows of matter, energy, and information that are influenced by practices. And these flows are used uh, by uh, society, uh, by human societies. So we define ecosystem services as uh, the benefits derived by individuals from ecosystem functioning. So if we don't have this social sphere uh, using these ecosystem services, we don't consider it an ecosystem service. When we do um, study on ecosystem services, we are in um, we are uh, studying the effects of changes. We are always in the context of changes, and we want to understand how practices, policies, projects, and everything um, influence this capacity of ecosystem to uh, provide ecosystem services and how it impacts human societies. We want to monitor these changes and then uh, to help planning uh, practitioners uh, to take into account uh, these losses or gains uh, of ecosystem services. So we have four types of ecosystem services. We have support services, which are, for example, uh, soil formation, retention, the development of uh, nutritional cycles or uh, production of oxygen, habitats, uh, everything. And then we have three other types of ecosystem services that we are um, more used to, to monitor and uh, develop indicators for these services. We have provisioning services like um, raw materials like wood, uh, like berries, if, um, we have uh, regulation services like flood mitigation, heat mitigation, and we have uh, cultural services like uh, patrimonial uh, services or recreation. Now, uh, when we do evaluation of ecosystem services, we are, as I said, in a context of change. And so we are in a context of policy or projects that will um, aim at conserving or uh, degrading ecosystems. And we observe a change in, bi in, in uh, biophysical structures of ecosystems, a change of functions, a change of quality or quantity of ecosystem services, and we aim at uh, measuring the gain or the loss for human societies. And we have the option to perform an economic valuation to value this change in, um, in monetary terms, for example. But uh, we have other metrics that are possible, like uh, in all the supply side, we have many biophysical metrics like tons of carbon or uh, water or uh, degrees that are mitigated by uh, vegetation. We have demand metrics like the number of visits or uh, number of person that benefit from uh, heat mitigation, for example. And we can have also monetary metrics. So as I said, in the EDFS project, we concentrate in uh, biophysical metrics and demand metrics, and we stayed here. Um, as the project is called Mapping Ecosystem Services, I wanted also to point out that uh, the spatial aspect of ecosystem services are really important. And why? Because uh, ecosystem services do vary across space. For example, imagine um, Heat mitigation. Um, this service will depend on the type of ecosystem uh, under study, the type of uh, use that uh, the ecosystem um, is uh, um, in which um, the ecosystem is under the, uh, a certain type of uh, practice, the climate, 
the evaluation and many things that influences ecosystem service supply. And in the demand side also, we have um, we have different spatial aspects that uh, influence this demand. For example, the access to um, to the ecosystem services, or uh, in the distance to beneficiaries and the number of substitutes, for example. So when we do mapping of ecosystem services, what are we studying? We are studying how much in uh, each location, in each uh, point uh, of the area, um, um, for example, how much uh, ecosystem services are supplied or uh, how much uh, benefit can natural infrastructure provide from uh, reducing urban heat. So we uh, study this how much, we study the where, and we study the to whom, um, who benefits from investment, for example, in greening or uh, reducing inequalities. So now let's go back to the project IDFES, now that you are expert in uh, ecosystem services. So the IDFES project was um, applied to the Ile-de-France region, uh, containing uh, the Paris metropolitan area that you can see here. Can you see my mouse or my mouse? I don't know. I just, or maybe. Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. I just I can put this. Um, so the region is characterized by a huge deprivation of um, urban green spaces for Parisians, mostly, and inner suburb uh, inhabitants. Um, and there is an important uh, ceiling uh, history in the inner and the outer suburb. So here you have the evolution of, uh, of uh, land cover between uh, 1982 and 2017. And um, this region is, in is interesting because uh, it holds significant um, inequalities uh, and it holds the richest and the poorest people in the country. So when we see um, the Ile-de-France region, we can see that we have 50% um, of uh, the area that is covered by, by agricultural areas and then forest and then mostly a uh, sealed surface. So the process of the project was um, as follow. We uh, first ask a focus group of uh, stakeholders of uh, stakeholders in urban planning, um, containing a diversity of actors to choose the services and the scenarios uh, to be that they wanted to be modeled in priority. So uh, we ask them to vote uh, for the different ecosystem services and then to provide indicators and uh, some scenarios to, to be studied. Um, then we modeled um, in historical and the historical evolution of land cover and uh, land use and, love and land cover to see where uh, areas have been sealed. And we modeled uh, eight ecosystem services that have been chosen by, uh, by stakeholders. Um, to do so, we used uh, different models, like um, one which is um, available in, uh, in, the, um, in the website of the University of Stanford that is called INVEST, which is Integrated Valuation of Ecosystem Services and Trade-offs. Uh, for uh, some uh, ecosystem services, we developed with uh, the, the University of Stanford two new urban invest model, and then we for other services where no more no models were um, were uh, available, we developed uh, our ad hoc uh, GIS model. 
uh, we conducted a three supplementary focus group to discuss on the results on the different models of uh, ecosystem services and on ceiling um, studies. Um, and we discussed uh, results and indicators uh, to reach a consensus on the different indicators uh, models. Um, finally, we tried with this, uh, with all these models. Uh, this is these are the results we are uh, going to to discuss after. Uh, finally, we tried to answer two kind of questions. The first were, was what lessons can be learned uh, when looking at the actual urban planning policies through the lens of ecosystem services? And the second one was, can ecosystem services information help in the design of urban policies? In the end, we had uh, 56 stakeholders of urban planning, uh, spatial planning involved in the project and 27 institutions. So let's um, answer to this first question. What lessons can be learned from the analysis of the past and future evolutions of uh, services? Um, the first lesson is that we stressed the need to go beyond soil ceiling indicator in environmental impact assessments of urban plants. Why? Um, because here you can see actual uh, environmental impact assessments indicators uh, that are um, that are present uh, in uh, one of the major plan uh, of uh, Ile de France uh, plan uh, urban planning, which is called the STRIF, which plans uh, for the future really the the destinations of uh, the land, uh, we, should it be uh, um, habitats or should it be uh, transport or should it stay as natural or not. And when you see the um, indicators for environmental uh, evaluation of this regional ma master plan, we see that we have um, only evaluation of soil conceptions, for example, the share of uh, ceiling um, of agricultural areas or um, uh, um, average public green space available for inhabitants. So you can see that uh, there is no really um, ecological information and uh, spatial uh, strategic um, information on the ceiling we are, per we are uh, uh, doing right now. Um, and we do think that um, we can, we can with uh, ecosystem services, provide better information. So, uh, as I said, the stakeholders in the uh, EDFS project voted for the different uh, ecosystem services to be, to be, to be modeled. And then we had uh, eight ecosystem services, uh, two provisioning services, the agricultural potential, groundwater recharge. In regulation, we had four ecosystem services like carbon sequestration, uh, heat mitigation, which is local climate uh, regulation, flood mitigation, water quality reg regulation. And we used for that uh, mostly invest, uh, and we developed this new uh, this new model for uh, the invest. In cultural ecosystem services, we had uh, outdoor recreation. We also developed the new invest model, and finally we had a biodiversity eco ecosystem services that has been modeled with a uh, ad hoc ad hoc um, geographical information system model. To give some uh, more practical and um, one practical example, I just uh, detailed one uh, service to because I want you to understand what I'm saying. So, for example, for the groundwater recharge service, we use uh, different um, spatial information. We have a function. Uh, 
of uh, land use and land cover, of hydrologic soil groups, the digital elevation models, subwatershed li sub watershed limits, and vegetation characteristics. And we calculate, uh, we calculate for each uh, pixel of um, Ile de France uh, how much precipitation we have in one pixel, how much evaporates, how much uh, is recharged, and how much is going to stream or underground water flow. And then we consider that the service is here is the local recharge, um, the groundwater recharge service. And this is like that for every services that I described just after. We have a spatial model for everyone um, with um, for to to have some um, to calculate uh, the ecosystem services given in each pixel of uh, Ile de France. So we are uh, looking after we have the models and we are looking after. Um, uh, the evolution between um, 1982 and 2017 um, of uh, soil sealing and of the different ecosystem services. So here uh, we have the soil sealing per municipality between uh, be, um, in these 35 years and here per uh, sub watersheds. Um, and here we have the evolution of uh, the different services and we can see that, um, for example, uh, here we have a net re renaturation of, uh, of Paris, but we have a net ceiling of the inner suburb of Paris and uh, the, the, the outer suburb of uh, Paris also. When we see the impact on ecosystem services, we have very different uh, types of impacts. For example, the agricultural potential uh, uniformly uh, decreased. It's also the case for the carbon sequestration or for urban heat mitigation. But we have um, other services where we have very much more heterogeneous um, evolutions. So we compared, we wanted to know if with um, the environmental impact assessment actual indicator, which are soil sealing mostly, we have the same information that when we have um, ecosystem services. And so do, to do so, to do so, we had some spatial and temporal uh, comparison between ecosystem services evolution and soil sealing evolution. So here you have the temporal uh, evolutions from, 19, uh, from 1982 to 2017. And um, you have the evolution of uh, natural habitats and of uh, green spaces, green, uh, urban green spaces. And we want to know if uh, the services has the same evolution, then it will be exactly on the same line than this. But we can see that the services has have different patterns and then it provides all the information. For example, we have the recreational potential that um, largely dropped between these uh, 35 years. Also, um, many other services like uh, agricultural potential and other regulation services. In the spatial um, evolution, we have uh, the, same, the same result. We have a mismatch between the soil ceiling evolution and ecosystem services evolution in 89% uh, of uh, the territory. So um, why do we have such different? Because ecosystem services mapping give complementary information than actual indicators of soil ceiling. And why such a difference? Because ecosystem services are impacted by an accumulation of uh, policies like urbanization, 
agricultural policies, which may uh, offset each other or get worse between uh, each other. Another um, aspect is that ecosystem services are mostly spatial in their supply and demand sites, as I told you, and all, uh, all sealing actions are not equivalent in terms of ecosystem services. So we, if we seal um, an area of forest in one place or in another place, it will not give the same, um, the same impact and the same loss. Uh, of ecosystem services because it depends on the context of this forest on if there are inhabitants uh, benefiting from this forest around etc and then um, we show that uh, ecosystem services can provide complementary information uh, because it is the intersection between nature and people so after this study we we this means that uh, it is time to move beyond from uh, the binary vision of natural versus artificial soil in environmental um, impact assessments of urban plants because we can give finer information uh, taking into account for ecological processes and the use of uh, humans of uh, this uh, this natural and uh, semi-natural habitats. Let's uh, jump to um, the ecosystem. The second uh, take home message is that uh, ecosystem services mapping can allow to see planning policies in a different flight. To uh, build this take-home message, uh, we had a scenario construction, so we just looked at uh, the evolution of historical, uh, the historical evolution of ecosystem services. Now we will look at the future of ecosystem services, and to do so, we construct some scenarios. So we construct scenarios, uh, three types of scenarios that were uh, wanted by stakeholders. Um, a scenar scenarios uh, um, from uh, agricultural transformation, greening scenarios, and sealing and densification scenarios. So the scenarios were whether disruptive or uh, trend scenarios, because they are based on uh, actual uh, plants or dem demographic trends. And um, for uh, these demographic trends, we used um, uh, cellular automata models, and we run uh, ecosystem services on new land cover maps. So we have different type of growth, uh, and uh, we are predicting uh, based on the historical evolution of growth of uh, urban sprawl, how uh, the future sprawl are um, are predicted. So in, I'm not to going to describe all the scenarios, but as I said, we have uh, agricultural scenarios, um, densification and uh, ceiling scenarios, and uh, greening scenarios. Here you have the variation of ecosystem services compared to 2017. <coughs> Here we have uh, the different uh, scenarios, and here you have the impacts on the different ecosystem services. So we are looking only at two scenarios. Uh, one scenario, which is the continuous um, uh, the densification, in which we see that we have a, an important impact on, on um, at least on urban heat mitigation and uh, outdoor recreation, which is logical because um, these densifications are made on, um, on open areas that uh, provide actually uh, some ecosystem services. And uh, we are um, densifying in these areas uh, um, in, in where people are uh, 
very much uh, dependent from these ecosystem services. Another scenario interesting is the Plan Vert, which is a greening uh, plan in Ile-de-France, um, in which we see here that we have a very, very uh, little impact on ecosystem services. Uh, why? Because the Plan Vert is actually not very uh, ambitious because it's, uh, it plans of greening 500 of uh, hectares of uh, 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 greening 500 hectares, and it's, it's really not sufficient to provide um, ecosystem so enough uh, ecosystem services when uh, four uh, thousand uh, would be needed. Okay, so right now we are going to jump on the proposals uh, on the design of urban policies, and we have made some uh, different studies on this. Um, and the first, um, the first proposal is on um, where to put the green in the future you know, plans of uh, Ile de France. So we built uh, different uh, things to answer these questions. Uh, this question. The first, um, the first study, and I, I give you this paper. I think uh, is on uh, the is on inequalities um, because we saw that the current uh, greening actions in Ile-de-France and in Europe and mostly in the world. Uh, are uh, targeting areas with the least uh, urban green spaces. Um, and there is no uh, accounting for economic characteristics of residents. So we are regarding plants actually are regarding where there is the lowest access uh, to nature and we target these areas for the future developments of uh, urban greening. One of the problems with this targeting strategy is that it can potentially accentuate social spatial inequality, which are already high in Ile-de-France, as I said. In Paris, for example, uh, the upper class um, live in high density neighborhoods, like uh, here, here, and um, <clears throat> they have very little uh, access to urban green spaces. So targeting a strategy based sol solely on the avail availability of green spaces in this specific case is an uh, unfair policy because it will tend to favor the already advantaged population. Then we wanted to develop a new um, criterion, a new method in order to target remigration, greening actions um, so that they benefit the most uh, disadvantaged people as a priority. To do so, we relied on the uh, a definition of well-being um, defined by uh, Stiglitz, Sen and Fitoussi, which um, which uh, define this uh, well-being in eight dimension, material living condition, health, education, political participation, social relations, uh, physical and economic insecurity and environment. And we define some proxies for Ile-de-France <laughs> to this uh, dimension. So uh, we used the disposable income, life expectancy at age of uh, 65 for health, education for education, uh, but political participation for the political participation, and uh, unemployment rate for physical and economic insecurity. And for environment, we use two types of proxy, the um, environmental, the exposure of inhabitants uh, of uh, environmental pollutions and disadvantages, which were uh, noise, uh, soil pollution, air pollution, 
uh, water pollution and, and another one which was access to nature. These are uh, the mapping of the, these proxies. And now um, we want, um, the aim is now to construct an index measuring inequalities uh, to target the future greening. It is quite easy when we have only one dimension because we uh, can transfer between a rich to poor individual to reduce inequalities. But things get more complicated when you have uh, more than one dimension at stake. Uh, the Pigou Dalton principle uh, is much more um, difficult. So, um, in a multi dimensional context, um, we wanted an indicator uh, to respect two properties. The first property is um, the okay. uniform. Hello? Oui, pardon, j'ai entendu un bruit, je pensais que... The uniform majorization principle, which accounts for the inequal distribution of welfare dimensions. Uh, and the inequality index decreases when the level of well-being on in uh, each dimensions are uh, average out. And the second one was the correlation increasing majorization. Uh, which accounts for the cumulative effects of inequalities. So the inequality in index increases when good scores are, um, <clears throat> are accumulated by the same person. We chose then a multidimensional index of inequality respecting these two, um, these two properties. And uh, so we chose the Bourguignon index, which is here where you have um, X, X, I, K, uh, the score in uh, one iris, which is uh, just a neighborhood, um, uh, which is the lowest statistical information we have in spatial, uh, in spatial information. Um, we have our dimension, which are the proxies, what uh, I uh, presented to you uh, before. We have um, weight on dimension, but we use the same weight for all dimensions. And we have uh, two, um, we have a, a beta here, which is the imperfect substitutability between well-being uh, well dimensions which uh, we use uh, uh, here. And then we have alpha, which is an inequality aversion index uh, based on the literature. And with all that, we can map uh, design greening policies by targeting areas with low score in multiple dimension of well-being. So we are uh, simulating an uh, increase of just access to nature, all things uh, being equal. <laughs> and we are looking um, the effects on the inequalities in all uh, Ile-de-France. So we can see um, here uh, we have uh, impacts. We have a strong reduction in inequalities in all the red areas uh, where residents are generally <clears throat> Sorry, it's generally disadvantaged, and not all of them have, have access to nearby green spaces. So uh, we have other uh, types of colors. Here we have no impact or an increase because um, the population, for example, have uh, good scores in the different uh, dimensions of well being. And uh, greening here uh, could increase uh, social, social spatial inequalities. Um, so uh, we propose to, to uh, target this, uh, this green, uh, these red areas uh, for which, um, for which uh, it reduces uh, inequalities in the region. Of course, we have uh, made some assumptions on 
for example, on the calibration of the different uh, parameters like the alpha and beta. And uh, so we conducted some uh, sensitivity analysis to see how much it changes results if we if we change uh, the the level of uh, alpha and beta. And we see that in the different simulation we have low uh, differences. The second aspect to take into account when deciding to re-green areas in, is the actual demand of uh, ecosystem service of uh, urban green spaces. Um, because in uh, actual uh, renaturation policies, we have no consideration of uh, these preferences. So we wanted to know a bit more um, of this uh, demand and preferences of urban green spaces in the Ile-de-France. And to do so, we conducted a method that is called choice experiment. I don't know if you know that, but um, this method will um, help uh, in, um, in determining what, which is the preference between different attributes here of nature of urban green spaces. And we present, for example, different hypothetical uh, nature spaces here and a state quo uh, option where there is no development of uh, urban green spaces. Um, Normally, in a um, choice experiment method, we have a monetary indicator um, and monetary attributes. Um, but here we, we put in the choice card uh, distance attributes uh, because we aim at determining the propensity uh, of um, inhabitants to perform greater distance for different attributes of nature and to know what are uh, where their willingness to travel to different uh, urban green spaces according to their attributes. Then we have a, a survey with questionnaires and um, which were uh, completed in 17 representative cities of Ile-de-France and we conducted uh, statistical models to characterize the preference uh, and identify uh, major other users' profiles, which are uh, latent class models. So here are uh, the 17 um, municipalities in where we conducted the different uh, surveys, uh, which were chosen according to the representativeness of uh, urbanization, density, and uh, standard mm -hmm. of living. Here we have a choice card, which is one example of uh, the choice we made in the survey for our respondent. They have the option between uh, two alternatives and a status quo. Uh, and this choice card, the urban green spaces um, depend on the different attributes, uh, which are forest cover, shape, presence of water, body, size, transport mode and transport time. We have 12 choice card per, uh, per uh, respondents, and then we have the choice they made. And this is what we are treating statistically with uh, latent class models. With that, we, we determine two uh, big classes of individuals um, in preferences. Um, and the two classes were um, after uh, were um, identified with um, social economic characteristics. So we have one first uh, class, which is living in relatively lower density uh, municipalities and lower rent areas which are uh, really able to make um, to um, to have uh, longer uh, travel or longer trips to the urban green spaces so to have uh, very qualitative uh, urban green spaces uh, that contain for example 
woods or water, um, whatever their size. And uh, we have a real preference to reach the urban green spaces by foot. Um, and then we have a second class which wants, uh, which live in a relatively higher density and higher rent area, which uh, really are have preference for a relatively lower, um, um, smaller uh, green spaces, but at a at um, proximity, um, which are not willing to travel very much for uh, urban green spaces, and that uh, really have preference for uh, to having uh, to having trees in the urban green spaces. This means that the access doesn't mean the same thing for different population, and we have heterogeneous preferences uh, between um, inhabitants. So having an access like uh, it is uh, written in the major uh, master plans um, in Europe, in France, in, um, of reaching, for example, um, a green spaces uh, at least um, at less than uh, 300 meters is not really interesting because uh, we have different preferences uh, regarding these green spaces. So we mapped uh, these preferences and we see that, for example, for this class of individuals, uh, they have a, a low um, supply demand, a, a low uh, um, deficit in, in uh, urban grid spaces because they are, a, they are able to reach uh, very much uh, um, um, uh, they are willing to travel very much more, uh, uh, have longer trips to urban green spaces. And for others, uh, we have a deep deficit because uh, they are not willing to travel very much for reaching urban green spaces. And the final, um, the final uh, uh, policy advice or urban. Uh, planning uh, policy uh, advice is uh, this on um, where not to put the gray. And this is the last study of uh, EDFS project. So it's the Charles Clarence uh, master thesis. So to not uh, put the gray or not sailing um, natural areas, um, we have two options we have uh, regulations of public land, for example, or we have incentive-based tool uh, to uh, protect private lands. But this is um, this is uh, dependent on the private owners of lands. This type of tools prove to be useful, very useful uh, for the conservation of urban ecosystem services, but. Um, in the literature, these two are uh, highly controversial as, they, uh, as to their ability to be effective and to protect uh, endangered uh, areas, um, uh, endangered uh, by ceiling. So we conducted a cost effectiveness analysis here um, to see the to maximize the conservation impact uh, in biophysical terms of a given budget and we studied um, one uh, incentive based tool which is called uh, obligation réelle environnementale which is um, um, a new tool uh, to to incentivize the owner to not steal uh, their uh, natural uh, gardens or other and um, in this study we see for each parcel of open land in the greater paris area we calculate the benefits and cost of conservation in which uh, the benefits are the relative loss of ecosystem services supply uh, in the ev event of solid ceiling. So we, we simulate a ceiling of all the gardens, uh, private gardens, for example, um, and their impact on uh, the tree services 
cooling, um, recreation, and flood pre prevention. And we assessed the costs, uh, which is the assessment of the value of development rights, uh, which are composed by, by uh, transaction costs and opportunity costs of uh, other contracts. And then we we um, we developed uh, this uh, map, uh, which tells where uh, does one euro invested in purchasing development rights have the greatest impact on ecosystem services conservation. So, of course, all uh, these areas are um, are uh, um, pixels that are not sealed but are sealable um, according to the, to the plan local d'urbanisme, to the plan um, uh, that, uh, occur, that uh, allow the sealing. So to conclude um, all this project, we have uh, a project that show that uh, ecosystem services information can help in giving more qualitative impact evaluations in urban planning policies. We have uh, an instrument um, for acculturation, territorial dialogue, rationalization of the public budget targeting uh, in a global context of film. We, uh, I didn't show all the results of the project, but uh, the production of uh, information, we know that also that it, must, it can be applied, but must be accompanied by awareness raising on the models and everything, and the concept training and capacity building in the concept uh, to be really usable by, by uh, practitioners. Here you have in French, uh, for French speakers, the final uh, report, uh, which is available also on the websites and all the publication in uh, English, uh, which are also available in the website. And for any question, um, here you have my email. <laughs>